Well, welcome everyone. We're really excited that you're able to join us for our second Ojibwe storytelling of 2024. Um, we are excited to bring you Tina Van Zyl, who's joining us tonight from Mo Lake. Is that right, Tina? Yes. Awesome. And, and while we're waiting, we've got a few minutes while everyone kind of logs on, we would love it if you would share in the chat box where you're joining us from. So like Tina said, she's from a lake. I'm joining you from Bad River. Uh, let's see where some of my colleagues are joining from. So just go ahead and put in the chat box. You can just put your town. Oh, there we go. Portland, Oregon. Lovely. It's great to have everyone. We had some great folks turn out last time and I hope we have some repeats. I hope we have some new folks. Uh, Janet, where are you coming from tonight? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Eau Claire tonight and I see a few folks online joining us from Eau Claire as well. I think it's a cold night across Wisconsin, so it's perfect night for storytelling. For sure. Very cold. Very cold up here, that's for sure. Amy, how about you? You have a lovely background. Oh, wait, I can't hear you, Amy. I think you're muted. I was muted. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Yep. I'm, uh, I'm here in Madison. The picture behind me is of the Yahara River, and it's just about that snowy and cold. And icy, did and you say? Oh, but happy yeah. to be here. <laughs> Great. Okay, Kristen, how about you? Hey, everybody. Um, I am in New Berlin, Wisconsin, also in the cold and the ice and the snow like Amy. <laughs> Abby, are you come, joining us from warm, warm weather? Oh, no, I'm in Madison, cold like most of us here. It's good to see y'all tonight. <laughs> Great. Is Noonan available? She might be. Oh, I am. So I am Sarah, and I'm joining from the west side of Madison, where it's below zero, I think. So. Okay. And how about you, Luke? I'm in the heart of Madison. It is very cold. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Unfortunately, it was so cold up here in northern Wisconsin. Um, we had to close. We had to cancel our watch party because we were a little concerned about people out on the road and and getting around in the weather. But um, we're hoping to have a watch party at the visitor center when we have Tinker next week. Um, so if you're in the area, please join us. If you were unable to join us tonight, I uh, apologize. We would have loved to see you. Um, but at least we're together online, which is lovely. Really lovely. I saw someone put in the, the chat, Tina, that they're a mole laker. What? Maybe, <laughs> what it's my, maybe it's my brother. <laughs> He's the one mole laker. <laughs> and we got one mole laker. Well, we got you. So we got two mole lakers. <laughs> so that's great. And we got a few other folks. How are we doing on time? We're just about ready to open up. And we've had folks from all over, including Canada, which is lovely. A lot of our friends up in Ontario, a lot of uh, Ojibwe tribes up in Ontario that have been joining us, Tina. Uh, it's really nice. Um, I think we had someone from almost every tribe and every Ojibwe tribe in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, um, which is really good to see that brotherhood, sisterhood, you know, coming also, out to support each other. What's that? It's also a little intimidating. <laughs> No, don't be intimidated. They're all here to absolutely cheer you on. One thing I learned last year was that, especially for our kin that have moved away or in college or away from their homelands, this is a beautiful way for them to have a little piece of home for an hour, right? Um, just kind of like the, the aunties they, they remember having, you know, we're kind of their surrogate aunties tonight. And um so it's really, I really appreciate you sharing your heart, sharing your time. Um, and I know, as, and I'll speak for those that um, are living away, it, it really means a lot. And to our non-Native friends, it means, it means a lot as well, because they don't always have access to uh, tribal community members. So it's fun for them to see a, a little peek into our lives, which is lovely for them. Okay, Kristen, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is a little housekeeping slide. So you're automatically muted when you join Zoom. If you have a question for Tina, please use the Q&A button. And you can write it anytime during the presentation. She's gonna talk for about 
45, 50 minutes. And then at the 10 minutes at the end, we're going to save for all your questions. Chat is going to be closed here in about a minute. It's going to be closed while Tina's sharing your stories. And it will reopen at the end if you want to still tell us where you're from or say goodbyes or leave her a message. Um, that's all absolutely welcome. So go to the, is it the next one already? Or is this where I... Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to head out and I'm going to leave you with Tina Van Zyl. Uh, Tina, take it away. Uh, we're really glad to have you here tonight. Thanks. Thank you much for having me, Liz. I appreciate you and I'm honored that you would even consider me uh, to be a part of your series. Cause like I told you, earlier, I don't really uh, consider myself a storyteller, but um, I have like, I have a lot of history in me with my job and just, you know, being raised here in, in Chicago. And so hopefully um, the things that I kind of chose to, to share with you all tonight is of interest. Um, I would just randomly be thinking about things, um, whether I'd be, you know, can't sleep at night and then I'd grab my phone and jot down a note or two. So um, hopefully uh, you guys enjoy the some of the things that I remember. So um, just want to say good evening. Buju, shao nagizko, kandizna kas, biju and dodain, sakagani and dunjaba. Um, I just said hello, and uh, my name is Shauna Gishkok, which means yellow sky. And uh, I'm from the Lynx clan, and um, my home is with the Sakagan, but I am also <clears throat> a descendant of the Forest County Potawatomi. Um, my dad is from here, uh, Sakagan, and my mom is from Forest County Potawatomi. Um, so <clears throat> what I chose to uh, start with is... Uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, my parents. And uh, hopefully I don't get too emotional uh, because they're no longer with us. But, the, you know, what kept coming back to me was, you know, share what mom and dad taught you and um, share what they instilled in me and my brothers and my sister and you know, the grandkids, is, and that was their love of um, manumen. Um, and for folks that don't know what manumen means, it's um, that's what we, our Ojibwe word for wild rice, which actually is uh, the good berry. And um, the reason I chose that is because when I was looking back at kind of my life and the job that I do, I... I always come back to my, you know, my parents and the things that we were able to do as children and growing up and just seeing the, um, the love, especially from my dad, uh, for wild rice. And when I say loved, if you ever knew him, that's how you would explain it. He had love, he had respect, um, and just the overall caring for, for Manuman. And um, growing up, we would, um, I remember as a little kid, which it probably wasn't safe, but as a little kid, I was, um, I always had separation anxiety um, from my parents. I never wanted to be apart from my parents. And um, I actually used to go ricing with them. And even though I was too small of rice, I would be sitting right behind my mom in the canoe. My dad would make me a little spot. And thinking back today, I was like, that was probably very safe, <laughs> especially if we, um, you know, they were to tip the canoe or something. But um, that's some early memories I have. And the best part of my life has been with them and my siblings. Because when it was racing time, um, that's when we, you know, you could just feel this um, aura, if you want to call it, off my dad. And, you know, like his, his not that he was a grumpy guy because my dad was a big teddy bear, but um, he just he just became really excited when it was that time of year. And then he'd be getting all of his things ready for our rice camp. And 
what I mean by rice camp is um, at home, you know, he he's always processed his own wild rice. And whether it was um, when we first lived at the, uh, the first projects on the reservation, uh, which I think Kristen is going to pull up one of the some of the pictures. And uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to wait for her. But anyways, <clears throat> in the pictures, you can see that my mom is in the blue. She's got the blue like handkerchief on her um, head and she's she's winnowing wild rice. <laughs> and my brother's in the background in that sitting in that red chair, taking a break from uh, dancing wild rice. And, um, you know, all of us, what my dad kind of taught us is that all of us have a part. Um, as a family to to do certain jobs and it'd be whether we're all going to pick wild rice which I was too young back then and so um, I guess I got to be able to be more of a kid and just you know be involved with everybody and seeing what they do but my older siblings you can see some of them got put to work more that's my brother Roy um you know, bagging up rice with my mom and my sister. And, and so it was always a family affair. Um, you know, everybody had a job, like what I liked the most as I got older is I liked parching wild rice. And it was because for me, the swishing back and forth of the rice in the tub over the fire um, had for me had a calming effect. And I just enjoy that you kind of get lost in and watching the rice switch back and forth. And then, um, you know, our dad would taught us that if you start to hear it pop, then it was time to get it off the fire. And um, then we would take the bucket and um, he had these boxes or tubs, you know, that you then you'd put the parched rice in and he'd say, be careful not to to get all that dust in there. You can get the rice out without getting all the dust in it. So we had this little process and, um, you know, maybe my older brother, who's like three years older than me, you know, he'd be dancing it or um, my mom, would, I feel like my mom was the best at um, fanning. We, I call it fanning, but mo nowadays people say winnowing and that's to, to throw it up from that birch bark basket and let the let the air and wind kind of pull off those husks or blow them off but um but I I, I want to really say that um you know besides taking care of the family and then picking rice with my dad and um having to be a part of the process my mom still found time to um cook over the fire so long as my dad had the fires going because we usually had a double-sided fire um, you'd be parching on both sides of it but my mom would end up still through all of that she had to do she'd find time to make a big pot of soup and um what I miss so badly of hers is um I'll, I'll call it like pan bread they didn't you know because we don't use the s word anymore so she'd make pan bread. So she'd take her fry bread dough and um, she would take hot coals from the fire and prop her cast iron pan. And she would she would take the dough and put it in the in the hot. I mean, in the cast iron. And my dad would pull some coals off there. And it, it really kind of like bake there over the uh, next to the fire. And um when you ha don't have your parents around anymore, it's <clears throat> things that you you know you wish you wish you could have again, and that's one thing that um, I really miss that I haven't been able to like duplicate. Um, I've learned other things she's done, like her biscuits that she made for us and me, and my brother. My brother uh, Norb is actually uh, better at it than me, <laughs> but. That's not a bad thing. That's good. I said, he brought some over the other day and I was like, man, bro, these are just like moms. And so it kind of takes you back, you know, it takes you back for all those good memories that we had. And so <clears throat> my dad was really particular 
um, if anybody was helping with processing when my dad was uh, alive, is that he is he was a perfectionist. Uh, every little step in the process from uh, drying the, so for instance, you're drying the rice when you're putting it out on the tarps. And um, if you dared step on his tarp with your feet that were muddy or dirty, he, you'd get scolded. And that's what I'm talking about when you talk about the respect for the rice itself. You know, he was like, there's one, there's a difference between dancing the rice and stepping on it and you wouldn't dare do that with my dad around because you'd get scolded and and that's all about teaching you to you know to respect that and value that because you know monoman is a sacred food for us and so we have to treat it that way because you know it's it's another living being that's um, just like us and we have to show it that respect and so all these different processes. So then if you like went to parching, you know, and if you didn't master it, my dad, even if we were very good at it, my dad would be right kind of over your shoulder and keeping an eye on you. And you kind of knew <laughs> that he was. And um, you would strive to do better and to, to do it um, exactly like he liked it because he 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 learned all these ways from from doing it many years and so he was just trying to teach us to the things that he learned that made it easier or better or um, you know he, this guy would be down to timing um, you know once he built a thrasher he had it down right to a time um, and that's because he thrashed it many times and you know okay 10 minutes is too short and uh, 22 minutes is too long and 19 minutes is perfect. Um, so yeah, we all we all just got to be together and um, be a part of that cultural thing that was a you know a big part of our community because um, that's something that he grew up on and he you know he wanted to share it with all of us and so um, yeah, I mean that's that's some of the best times. For me, and uh, I'm just going to, I'm just looking at my notes, sorry. Um, and so the, for me, um, little would I know that, you know, years down the road that I would end up being um, in the in tribal environmental department and um, we'd be facing uh, the potential uh Pran in mind that was trying to come in for a long, long time. And so um, that's why I, I kind of chose to talk about him because he was the first person that instilled in me um, to fight and protect it. And so in my job, I had to, you know, speak to many different federal agencies. And so um, I would always just try to think about my dad, and then I would try to always think about the battle here in Mole Lake. For those of you who um, may not know, there is a battle, in, um, they figure around 1806, and it was between uh, the Jiwe people here and the Sioux people, and they were fighting over the wild rice beds. And so, as you can imagine, because we're still here, we won, but it came at a big cost. Um, we have a marker in Mole Lake here, and there's roughly, they figure there's roughly like 500 warriors, and they're Ojibwe and Sioux people that are there. And so, I would visit the marker sometimes when I felt like in my job I was I was feeling like I couldn't do something or like maybe I had to go to Washington DC for a meeting and I didn't feel like I was a strong enough leader. Um, so I would go to the marker and I would, you know, read what was there. And I would just remember that, you know, Tina, your ancestors fought for this and many of them, you know, died for it. So no matter what challenge you have, um, you can do it. And so I would 
I would just keep that in my heart along with, you know, the passion that my dad instilled in us. And then, and then later on, working in the environmental department in the early years and being involved with uh, uh, mining impact committee members and just community members and working alongside rice chief. Um, you start to feel what all of them feel. And so it becomes easier for you to talk about it and to, per and to, 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 face challenges of um, talking to federal agencies because that's, you know, as a tribal leader, that's a, that's a hard thing in itself sometimes because, you know, you might lose your words or you feel like maybe you're not experienced enough. But I just try to always remember <clears throat> these, these, the, the heart and the heart of it. And so, um, with always feeling that and remembering that, it always seemed like I could overcome any of those challenges when it came to um, having to speak for the wild rice and um, in any way I needed to. So, um, and that's why um, here at home, we have chosen to uh, restore Spur Lake because my dad and some of the other rice chiefs like, um, um, Chuck Ackley and Jeff Ackley and Bones and um, Pete McGeezik and uh, Roger McGeezik. Um, a lot of them, I remember them talking about how Spur Lake was um, like their second choice to go to because that lake was um, the, my dad would always say when he couldn't, maybe it was a bad year in Rice Lake here on the reservation. He said he always liked to go to Spur Lake because that rice was the most like ours here at home. It was the bigger kernel and, and the makeup of the lake itself was much like it is here. Then my dad would talk about how when he was young, um, they, the chief would take them, um, many people from here to Spur Lake because way back then not everybody had a vehicle and so you know he would they would drop them off at Spur Lake and they would have to camp there you know right along the shores and that and um maybe it's for a couple of weeks or a few days however long they needed and so that place uh to me was very meaningful because of the rice chiefs would always refer to it I mean they talked about a lot of other lakes too but that one more in particular. And um, so we're, we're in a restoration project with uh, Wisconsin DNR and um, Natural Resource Foundation and uh, Brico Foundation and our tribe and Glyphwick. Um, we hope someday to, to bring back wild rice and Spur Lake. We have cooperation from the owners uh, some of the homeowners around the lake and um, it's been a, a few years that we've been involved in the project we've only been reseeding now for two years we have some different plots out there um and then we had a like a celebration or a outreach education last summer um on spur lake not on spur lake but next to it and um so there was this film crew that was coming out because they wanted to document um, uh, the work that all of us were doing, you know, DNR and Natural Resource Foundation and the tribe in Glyphwick. And so they were doing a video to make sure everybody that was involved got to be in it. And then we got to Mole Lake and, you know, I asked some ricers to go out and so we could get some film from them. And then the video people asked if um, they could see some of my home photos, which are those two on the top with the racing, because I believe that one on the right is where my br brother Roy is break, uh, bagging up the rice. I think that's from Spur Lake. Anyways, when I was showing him some pictures and what I didn't get to include in um, sending it to the 
the webinar here is, I don't know if you see this or not, but this is a picture from the Rylander Daily News. And um, it's of my mom. She's, she's, it's September 8th of 1979. And she's coming off of Spur Lake, her and my dad. And she's showing the guys in the news that's doing the news how to, um, you know, knock the rice off with her, with the cedar rice sticks. And uh, man, I broke down when I, I saw my mom because she's, you know, it's just a tough thing when your parents are gone and you see all these, these good memories. And uh, just kind of makes you know that what you're doing in life is, um, is what you're supposed to be doing. Because I've been in the environmental department for um, this summer will be 30 years. Kind of crazy. I don't feel that old, but man, um, it just, it, it, I know I'm doing the right thing. So, uh, sorry for getting emotional there, but sometimes I just can't control it. <clears throat> Um, you're doing you're doing awesome, Tina. I really respect and appreciate you. And I was just texting my sister. I'm getting wicked bad 1970s res nostalgia here. Just looking <laughs> at those pictures, they're they're absolutely beautiful. That we have received a few questions. Do you want to wait till the end, or do you want to do a couple now? Um, let's see. I think, yeah, sure. I can, I can take a couple. Okay. It was about specifically about the rice. Um, they asked when is ricing time and the steps of it and how long does it take to process? Cause you talked about thrashing and parching and knocking. Um, but can you put that in order for everybody? Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, ricing season, usually, um, it really depends on the weather. Um, it, so it, sometimes it can be as early as late August. Uh, but typically it's September um, and, um, you know, there might be a run of it where the, it's harvestable for two to three weeks. And then, you know, we can get some weather that just knocks it all down, like severe rainstorm or something. So, but typically two to three weeks is the harvestable time. And then the process is, of course, so, you know, they're out picking it and they bring it back. And so then the first thing they got to do is they have to dry it. So they put, usually nowadays people put it out on tarps and it's, it's kind of a fine layer, you know, you don't want the, it's got to be spread out really evenly. Um, and then, you know, they're using the, the sunlight to, to dry it. There's no, no fast way to dry it. You just got to hope for good weather. And if there's not, say if there's rain predicted for a couple of days, then um, actually, you know, you just, you know, most people have a place to keep it. And then like my dad would probably put it in the garage and have it laid out in there. Um, but, you know, you really pray for good weather. So that's natural sunlight dries it out. So once it's dried out, then, um, <clears throat> then we would have my dad, my dad always had a double-sided fire plate, a uh, fire so that we were all working um, on both sides. So there was always two parches going at a time. So he would just have bricks set up and then the fires in the middle. And then the, there would be these round tubs, mm -hmm. you know, big tubs. Um, and then one tub was on each side. It was propped up like kind of at an angle. And then um, he was particular about what kind of wood too, but honestly, I can't remember what kind of wood. I'd probably have to ask my brother. Um, and then he would, you know, he made his own um, uh, par uh, parching um, paddles. Usually they're out of cedar too because they're nice and light. And so you you kind of have to swish the rice back and forth in the tub until, like I said, my dad would say, until you could hear it pop because it would start popping. You almost went too far. But I personally love when it gets to that popping point. I like that rice versus taking it off the parching too quickly um so Does then it give you, a different flavor um i think it cooks uh better when it's gone that far okay. but that's just my personal opinion <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so then you take it from the um, parting to, um, so we would put it in all, usually at cardboard boxes or he had tubs or something. And then somebody would start um, fanning it. And um, so then, um, so from fanning, you know, sometimes you, that's, um, takes, that's kind of a longer process because it takes a while to, to, to get all the husks off. So from there, he'd have a little station set up where he made his own like sieve where he put the rice on and um, you'd start at one end. He'd, it usually was a long rectangle sieve that he would make. Was he'd it a screen? It. Like a screen? a screen? Okay, yeah. yeah. Grip had one of those, yeah. Yeah, so he'd put rice on one side and you would literally have to just <laughs> sit there and pick off the husk. And then once you're done, you move that section over, pick some more. Um, and then somebody might winnow it again after that. Um, and then, oh, I forgot the dancing. I'm sorry. At, after um, you parch it, then you dance it. Then you fan it. So I forgot the dancing part. But nowadays, people, instead of dancing, um, a lot of people do have built thrashers. So the thrashers, uh, you put the rice in there and it kind of tumbles it like a washing machine to get the husks off. And then they got the setup where the fan blows off the husks off both the back end. So, um, yeah. And then the last, after the winnowing and picking up all the husks and then it's ready to go. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Just, we had a lot of good questions. People are really excited. Um, they also had, uh, Oh, someone wants to know the difference between picking rice and knocking rice. Cause I think I said knocking and you said picking. Um, it's the same thing. Okay. And, and then they, they, I just wanted to let our viewers know she means wild rice. Someone asked if they, if what kind of rice you meant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, I just want to make a point too that um because somebody asked me this today um my actually my physical therapist mm -hmm. um she she thought you know we pick rice like we go with a modern boat and I said no I, I said we have to have canoes and push poles and then the, you know somebody with the rice sticks I said because I said motorized boats are not allowed on our lake I said you will get scolded and dragged up um so but that's a respect thing right because the to to treat that rice with respect you don't want to go in there and tear it all up so they still harvest it in the old way with the canoe and they build their own push poles and carve their own sticks and so yeah it's it's done the old way you know no no flat boats no Paddles, no motors, nothing. Motors are not allowed on our lake at all. Okay. All right. I'll let you get back to it. I'm sorry, Tina. <laughs> um, so it, I just, you know, wanted to quickly mention that wild rice is a, a very sensitive plant. So um, it likes free flowing water. It likes, um, it's very sensitive to uh elevated rice our water levels like um and now we're noticing in the last few years um you know five seven years that humidity long humid days is playing a part in it and uh, affecting what's now called brown spot so um just and it's very sensitive to metals and uh probably maybe 20 years ago now, we paid Colorado State University to come here and do a metal a metal spike test on wild rice. They didn't do it on the lake itself, but they took our rice, they took our water, and they did this. Um, they would spike it with copper um, because that's one of the biggest um, things for the crown and mine. Um, and it sh it shrinks the roots so if that mine were to ever open which it won't now that we're owners of it um of the property but um the metal um caused the roots to to not grow so they took a when it they had start to finish and so the starting one was the you know nice long root growth and the the tiny bits that they would spike it with um, 
with the metals, the root would just, it got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And if you can imagine the shorter it gets, it can't, it can't take root. And so it would just flop over. And so um, it would have definitely been destroyed if that mine were to ever open. So um, we're very fortunate here that, you know, we were able to put a stop to that. And it's something that we'll have uh, in perpetuity, you know, especially if we keep teaching our, um, you know, younger generation um, to, to keep protecting that for, for, to keep it going forward. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch gears and um, kind of talk about a little bit about gathering and um, kind of more what my mom would talk about. And um, so first of all, you know, off, always offering tobacco or same offer anything that you gather from Mother Earth. Um, whether it be you're out picking berries or gathering cedar or picking wild rice or, um, you know, harvesting walleye or muskies or, or anything that your, your hunt fish or gather. Um, and I know there might be a lot of people online that would say, I know that I know to offer tobacco, but you'd be surprised that um, how many people don't know that and aren't taught uh, because I work um, with summer youth. I write a grant to employ summer youth every year. And um, some of them, you know, just weren't raised in the household that does that. So that's something that I try to do with the youth is to take them out and um, just, you know, gather one or two things so that they have the experience. And, um, and you know, so we believe that making that offering to the creator is, you know, to, to uh, you know, I try to talk to the youth. I said, you know, the things that I say is, you know, I'm thankful for you for providing this for us. So let's say talk about berries. You know, I, I appreciate that you still provide this for my people. And um, I'm only going to take what I need. I'm not going to over harvest and um, just talk with the kids. Yeah, I go, you kind of, I told them you got to kind of talk to um, the creator, like, you know, the person is right there, you know, and you're, you're talking um, and making that offering. And so um, kind of along with that, my mom always said that, um, she so she they call me baby you know I remember so that's what I'm saying she you know, she'd say baby you have to um always gather what you can gather and I I would say what do you mean by that mom and she'd be she said that um she said for instance like when we go pick blackberries or raspberries she's like um you always make sure to do this okay she says because if you don't go and gather things she said the creator is going to think that you don't need them anymore and she said maybe you can't go all the time but she says make time to even if you can go one day she goes you go gather the things that you you need um so I always remember that and so sometimes with my job and the busy life that I have um I can't I don't always have enough time for everything but I will always make sure I do one day of something so that I, cause I, I can't ever get that out of my head about what she said. And I don't want, um, you know, the creator thinking that we don't need that anymore. And I don't know how, how if anyone else has told that story, that's something my mom shared with me. And I feel like she probably shared that with, with me because, um, her and my Aunt Mary Jane and then my grandma and great aunt, um, they always harvested, uh, I mean, gathered medicines um, and then would always use those medicines for the family. So um, like, I don't, some people probably not, might not make this connection, but 
the Forest County Potawatomi's health and wellness. Um, they kind of dedicated their their health and wellness to my grandma and my great aunt, um, Kewednok and Wasagijik. And so they they weren't like the only um, our gatherers of medicine, but um, you know they were honored. Um, two ladies that were honored there, and and so my mom and my aunt Mary Jane um, kind of picked up that as well. And so my aunt Mary Jane would always call my mom and say, "Hey, can you take me out?" Because for some reason Mary Jane didn't um, drive. She still doesn't to this day, but um, so. You know, I'd be with my mom and my aunt, and um, we'd be way back in the woods, like all over the place. And they'd be back there, you know, gathering medicines, and uh, Mary Jane would be putting them together. And, you know, maybe it was um, things that she wanted to put into the to bear grease, because, um, you know, certain things that you put in there um, helps with like arthritis or joint pain um or she would gather things that would for our tea um like if we had a sore belly she had a medicine for that or if you had a like a congested cold my aunt and my mom would they would just make this really hot powder like this powder you put it in tea it'd be so hot it felt like you it burnt the sickness right out of you um so I feel that that's why my mom told me that story is because she's come from a family that um gathered all the time and so gathered medicines mostly and so she didn't want things to be lost so I try to do as much as I can um so like because I really love cedar tea and um chaga tea and one thing I'll mention about um, chaga tea is, um, you know, everyone thinks that you learn from someone older than you, but um, I think it was March 2020, and uh, my daughter Tashina um, was scheduled to go in for a C-section to have her second child, and I was getting really, really sick, and it just the start of COVID. And I was so worried that they weren't going to let me be there because I was, you know, I was there for the birth of all of her children. And I was like, there's no way I cannot be there. But I, you know, I was developing this cough and, you know, my sinuses. And it was my stepson who said, have you ever tried chaga before? And I said, actually, no. I said, I haven't. I said, I'm not sure why, but. I said, I'm willing to try anything. I said, I have to be there for her. And so he brought his over and um, he said, use some of this rose hip in there too to kind of give it some flavoring. Um, and I was like, okay, thanks so much. And and um, along with that, so he's younger than me, obviously. Yeah, uh, You know, he's now he's like 36 or something. Um, so you can learn from younger people too. And um, so along with him and what my mom taught me is one thing she taught me as well is um, you have to believe that these things will help you. You can't be optimistic about it. You have to just accept that the creator put that stuff there and believe that it's going to help you. So when I I made my uh, chaga and rose hip tea and um, I had some honey that were from our beehives here that I for our youth project we have beehives here just down the road from my house I used a little bit of that honey in there and um, so I started that on a Sunday my daughter had to go in on a Tuesday and um, that quick I I was better. Like I no longer had a cough at all. And I was on, um, you know, I was developing a very wicked cough. And so it worked that quick. And um, 
he just made me a, a believer. Now when anybody's sick, that's what they get. They get chaga tea with rose hip and sometimes I'll make cedar tea and I actually sometimes mix them together and um it's you know it's really good and the little grandkids, you know, if they're not feeling good and you know I just swear by the tea now. <laughs> um <clears throat> and then so along with um so kind of switching a little gears in a little bit more um and I'm getting close to my end of that time so I just want to kind of talk about um, um when we do anything culturally whether it's um whether maybe I'm cooking for ceremonies or um I'm in a couple of days I'm going to be teaching how to make moccasins to uh, community members or youth at our youth center or um Maybe you're sewing somebody um, a ribbon skirt or, or you're making a dish bag or any of those things like that. Um, I think it's really important to be in your good, the best place you can be in your mind, like in your positive thoughts, because especially when we're cooking for ceremonies. Um, I, can't, I can't talk too much about ceremonies because that's something you have to go to in order to learn. I can't just talk about it here. Um, but one thing I can mention is that when, when we're cooking for them things, you know, we're taught to, to pray into our food. And so while I'm cooking, I always try to have some type of um, harvested food whether it be wild rice or deer meat or walleye or berries or you know something that was harvestable um I'm praying into that food that I'm making and um because they if you put those good positive thoughts and prayers into into the food that you're making for your community um you know they say that um people who who eat that are going to get those good prayers from you and so that kind of goes along with all of our cultural things that we do is you know you kind of got to be in a good positive place when you're sewing you know maybe you make like you know I make ribbon skirts mostly for my my daughters and my daughter and granddaughters um or sometimes I'll make a ribbon skirt to give away at ceremonies but um, I always try to stay in a good positive place because I just feel that kind of applies to everything you know um, when you're teaching moccasins you, you know you want people to be laughing and, and enjoying one another because then I kind of feel like what you're doing that things are going to turn out or it's going to work out and so because you're putting that good energy of yourself um, into into whatever you're doing. Um, I think that's. I just want to mention one last thing, quick. Um, since I have about I think four minutes, if I reading that correctly. Um, I just want to mention that um, some of my hobbies are. Um, reading every anyone who knows me knows I am a total bookworm and so if you want to know like a lot of stuff about our native people or indigenous people there's so much material out there like through Glyphwick um and I mean Glyphwick probably puts out some of the best educational materials so you know feel free to reach out to them because over the years they've put a lot of hard work into um good you know books and guides and just things about treaty rights and um yeah and I you know I love to sew uh even though I don't have a lot of time for it um that's like I think sewing is probably my favorite thing um because there's nothing like taking all this fabric and ribbon and um, you know, making applique patterns and and seeing the end product. And then um, I used to make all my own daughter's regalia and then 
see her, it finished and her out there dancing, you just get a, a different sense of pride and being able to do it yourself. And um, I'm pretty much self-taught. You know, I, I, I took a sewing class in that high school and that, but um, I'm what's pretty can turn anything inside out and figure out how to sew just about anything. Um, and then, so I was going to recommend some books, but I couldn't find all of the books that I wanted to, to share. So, um, just want to, uh, say me glutch to everybody for, um, tuning in. And I hope that it was interesting <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I'll take some questions. And I, like I said, I, I'm just really honored that I was considered because like I said I don't really think of myself as a storyteller but um so Jamie got to everybody for um yeah. listening yeah but you shared some great great stories and experiences that connected with me and other people's I've been watching in the chat a lot of questions, a lot of detailed questions. Um, so one of them is, can you explain more about chaga tea? What is chaga tea, first of all? So and how do you make it? <laughs> okay, um, it's it's kind of like a, a growth or mush, I think it's like mushroom on, the, on mm -hmm. a certain tree. And you harvest it in a certain way so that you don't kill it um, and so that it regrows. Uh, without pictures, it's kind of hard to explain, but sometimes you can see on these trees where it has like a, it's a dark black, it looks like a growth, really. Um, but you harvest that off and then you, you got to dry, you know, you know, chunk it up and dry it. And, uh, you know, you end, only end up with like little chunks, if you can see my hand, little chunks of it. Like I take, uh, I take a, a tea, a uh, round tea ball. And I put, so I take the chaga and I put it in there, like one or two chunks, depending on how much I can fit in there. And then I take the dried rose hips and I, you know, put like, a, I don't know, like a teaspoon of that in there. And then I close the little mesh ball and then I just boil it in uh, some water um, and not even like a hot boil. It just kind of got a, you know, just kind of a soft boil and, and then because you have it in that tea ball strainer thing, um, you don't have to strain it. You can just pour it right into your cup. And then I always try to use the honey from straight from our beehives here. And another one is, do you have another good herbal recipe or favorite that your mama or grandma or someone shared with you? Um... I I don't know how to make it, but I think what the favorite probably was is this what they put in the bear grease because I use it for my back. I have I have back problems. I have my third back surgery, and so I have a lot of muscle spasm and and muscle pain. So I use the bear grease um for for my hips and stuff. So that's probably the best stuff. And I would have to ask my Aunt Mary Jane um, because I, I, don't, I wouldn't remember what's in it now. You caught me off guard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, someone else, I think one of your, maybe one of your students said you're having your, your moccasin making in a couple of days and community's very, very excited about that. Um, and they just wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we let the audience know what a valuable resource you are in your community. That's definitely one of the goals here with this series is we take community members, people that are really valued within their community. Um, and so uh, it's just exciting. Do you have any beep work you wanted to share? Do you have anything? Um, sure, I, I, I have to finish my lanyard. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but mm -hmm. good. Um, it's just a little baby lanyard. Um, that's peyote stitch. Um, and then it seems like I have a lot of unfinished projects. So I have, <laughs> Don't we all? I have like my tobacco pouch. Um, Got to put the, the string in it. I mean, the tie in it yet. Um, I've done a few earrings. Um, 
Um, and then the moccasins. So, oh, you know, my favorite is I love beating eagle feathers. Of all, oh. the, if I could use, like, of all the beating, I like all this other stuff, but I, for some reason, because eagles, I, like, everyone knows that, like, if you look around my house, like there's so much eagle stuff in my house. Um, I just get so much satisfaction out of beating eagle feathers for family members or anybody, you know, wants some. In the What's, what would be the occasion for that? Like graduations or ceremonies or when would beaded uh, eagle feathers come in? Well, for me, I, um, I beaded for my brother's for Christmas. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is for um, when people graduate because they want to put it on their um, graduation cap. So, yeah. or um, I know like I was gifted um, beaded eagle feather just for um, an anniversary as an employee of the tribe. You know, someone beaded me a eagle feather for that. And so there's kind of different things things that it's for um one of the other oh you mentioned glyphwick and so my colleague did put the glyphwick link in the chat box so those resources also you said you have a good list um, of books and readings so if you send those to me after this we're going to put them on our website so okay. for those of you who are interested in tina's reading list um, professor tina is going to give us our, our reading list which i love Tina's um, book club. <laughs> oh, I love book clubs. Don't daughter, get me started. <laughs> my daughter says, my God, mom, you read so many books. You really need to start your own book club or book review. Oh my gosh. If you did it over YouTube, look at all the fans you'd have. We'd all show up. Mm -hmm. So um, if you send me those, I'll put them up on our website so people okay. can see those. Okay. Um, the other thing is the ribbon skirt. Do you know the history and the story of this? Like when did this happened I don't really remember these in the 70s so looking at all those beautiful 70s pics yeah. so did we did we have them and lose them or or what happened you know you might have to ask somebody a lot older than me because in the 70s I'd have been like two and three years old don't say that <laughs> to my heart you wound me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that might be somebody that like Tinker might know some of those questions. Um, you know, so but but then if you look back in some historic photos, you will see some skirts, you know, with a little bit of ribbon work on it. So I think it's it's probably been around for a lot longer than we think. Um and it's just I think I think nowadays uh we're we're just, I don't know if we're, we're, I can't, I don't know. I don't want to say prouder because I'm not trying to say anyone's not proud, but you just see that people aren't as bashful to, to wear their skirt or to wear their ribbon shirt, you know, to a port, an important meeting or somewhere where they're representing their tribe or, you know, whatever. It's just more, they're, they just feel, you know, at, more comfortable with it now so we got a lot of questions from non-natives um wanting to learn more about our culture obviously that's why they showed up wanting to know what's appropriate what's what's inappropriate um if you're a teacher say in crandon schools or ashland schools is it appropriate to wear a ribbon shirt if you're a non-native person or a ribbon skirt on a special day or a special occasion, or should that be reserved for native people? I know that's just your opinion, but people are trying to figure out what, what, or should you ask your local elders or, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give, especially teachers that work with native kids? I would probably say what I've kind of heard around here is that's kind of something that it's for our people. Um, but I think it is also a good idea to ask whatever community that you are in and what they, um, what they, they teach because every, everybody's a little different in what they may believe. So I wouldn't want to say something, uh, across the board because that's definitely not how it ever is. Yeah. Okay. Good answer. Um. What else? 
they had <laughs> you could do a whole thing on just ricing we could probably do a three-hour session on ricing i <laughs> i don't even know where to start with all these ricing questions um one of them which maybe you can even answer is in your environmental aspect was water quality in rice there were some concerns about how important is water quality to preserving wild rice what what does wild rice need to grow and thrive well if you have wild rice growing it is a sign that you have excellent water quality because it is very sensitive to, um, like I said, to different things. And so um, here in Mole Lake, we have water quality standards that we have developed in 1995. And, um, and so we have very strict water quality standards here. Ours are st stricter than the state of Wisconsin. And uh, they're anti-degradation standards. So that means that um, they can't be, the waters can't be polluted in any um, way at, than what its natural state is now. So typically through states, you see water quality standards that are narrative, meaning they put numbers mm -hmm. to, it, it can't be, you know, mercury can't be, higher than this or you know whatever metal it is can be higher or lower than this well we we choose we chose not to do that and anti-degradation means that we're basically saying that the the waters how they are now is you can't do anything to degradate them than what they are existing and how we prove that is we've for many many years we we have a um, water monitoring program. So we, so our, our hydro, hydrologist, um, you know, he takes water, sam he does water sampling and then it gets sent into the labs and it tells you exactly how much certain, you know, metals and things are in the, in the water. So that way, if there was ever a project that came in and we needed to prove that they uh, polluted our waters. We have all these years of data of what's what's our waters been consistently. So it's extremely important uh, to have good water um, because it won't survive otherwise. Well, that's a good place to end. Thank you so much, Tina. I really appreciate it. Uh, Kristen, could you put up the the how to get a hold of Tina slide? So if um... I love that slide. Okay, so there she is. So if you need, if you have more questions or if you want to send her a at a girl, uh, tina.vanzile at scc nsn.gov. You can reach her there. And you're okay with taking questions, Tina, or you'll do your best? Yeah, sure. I mean, I won't be back to work till um after February 1st. Okay. But I've kind of been um check, trying to check my email at least uh once a day so uh don't be offended if you if I don't answer right away it's because I'm still on medical leave yeah well we certainly want you to rest up and get better that's that's a hundred percent sure okay and if we go to the next slide that's how you can get a hold of us we're on Facebook Instagram Twitter LinkedIn YouTube in fact this video will be on our YouTube channel it will also be found on the same Facebook page or the same website page where you probably registered for this series um, we will have a link uh, instead of Tina's picture now it'll be kind of this video there and you'll be able to click right on it so if there's any portions or pieces you want to watch, um, feel free. That would be great. And the next slide is Tinker is next week. So we've got two more weeks of storytelling next week, January 23rd at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Tinker Schumann from Lactoflambo will be joining us. Uh, same time, same place right here. Uh, uh, via the internet, via the Zoom. If you've already registered for, for Tina or Sorella, there's no need to re-register re for Tinker. You're already, you're already registered. And so, uh, so anyway, any last words, Tina, before we sign off? I'll just, you know, again, miigwech and uh, just giga wabamun to everyone. Gigawabaman. Great to see everyone. See you next week. Thanks again, Tina. Really appreciate it. Yeah. All right.
Bye. Good night.